Common Mystic Prayer, Gabriel Diefenbach, Chapter 9, Points of Difficulty and Encouragement. Since the soul generally feels estranged as it enters upon this period, it will greatly need to be consoled and encouraged. Everything is so unaccustomed, it hardly knows what to do or where to turn. Its usual conduct in this changing state of prayer is to resist the new direction of grace, or at least fail to cooperate with it properly. It may also have fears of delusion. Lacking its former feelings of devotion, it thinks itself incapable of devotion, and believes it is going backward. Hence the idea of advance seems to it an error. Besides this, it, that is the soul, will experience a repugnance in speaking of its condition. If it attempts to set this forth, it can find nothing specific to say. When questioned as to what it does in prayer, how it spends the time, it seems embarrassed and at a loss for an answer. It stammers, searching for phrases to describe what cannot easily be put into words. It may even declare it does nothing, or at least feels that it does nothing, which lends color to the fear of delusion. The only definite thing to be got from these souls is that they are generally contented and satisfied, though not knowing really why, and so feel disinclined to follow a suggestion or line of conduct that will interfere with their loving attention to God and tie them down to some particular act or thing. A soul in this state says of itself, I always give in to this attraction, and although I cannot perceive that it guides me well, I cannot help following it. I have an assurance, I do not know how, in the depths of my heart, that this way is right, not by the evidence of my senses, but by a feeling inspired by faith. Moreover, it may truly be said that its whole state and way is simply an impression of the gift of faith, which makes it love and appreciate those paths wherein the spirit has neither object nor idea, and wherein the bride recognizes the bridegroom unconsciously. She prefers to wander without order or method in abandoning herself to his guidance than to gain confidence by following the beaten tracks of virtue. But despite this sure guidance of faith, nature is ever clamoring to be heard. It wants to have that feeling of support, whether in emotions of fervor or through the satisfaction of some self-activity. As De Cassaud, so well writes to one in this condition, what you want is to find support and comfort in yourself and your good works. Well, this is precisely what God does not wish and what he cannot endure in souls aspiring after perfection. What? Lean on yourself. Count on your works. Could self-love leave a more miserable fruit? God desires to deliver you from all this and to destroy in you gradually all the help and confidence you derive from yourself so that he may be your sole support and hope. What augments the distress and discouragement in the beginning is the matter of distractions. The imagination frequently seems overrun with thoughts and images. When prayer is of a more consoling nature, carrying some sweetness in it, the soul is less troubled about distractions, but as it becomes a prayer of aridity, the distractions seem naturally more pronounced. But here again, the distinction between the superior and inferior portions of the soul is to be borne in mind. If the distractions are voluntary and occupy the attention of the intellect, they obviously stop spiritual prayer and have to be actively opposed. But if they are images that come and go merely in the imagination so that the attention of mind and heart is not centered on them, they do not impede the act of simple prayer. This prayer goes on in the superior part of the rational soul, above reasoning and reflection, beyond images and ideas, and so cannot be hindered by what goes on in the lower faculty, in the imagination. So long as the will or heart is toward God and wants only Him, the soul need not be troubled from the fact of distractions. Far different it is with a person using discursive prayer, which employs images, ideas, affections, and reflections. Any distraction here would necessarily take the soul out of prayer and away from God. In ordinary mystic prayer, neither thinking, feeling, nor imagining plays any part. 
but the mind and heart are occupied in a confused, general, loving knowledge of God in the center of the soul. Undoubtedly, the soul will find it irksome, at times, to be still before God, to remain in His presence in the simple spirit of faith. Yet, this is the way it must now cooperate with the workings of grace, for the Holy Spirit is gently drawing it to the interior. He is espousing the soul to Him in faith. The soul may wonder how long a condition so distasteful to the senses will last. With it all, there may be the feeling of being abandoned by God because the soul has lost all feelings of devotion. Sometimes it is not certain whether it loves God or not, or whether God loves it. This is very painful, but purifying. The soul must be encouraged to remain in the peace and tranquility wherein God is truly found, and not to stir up natural activity in the way of reflections or ejaculations, which is only a return to sense operations. Its spirituality is now founded upon the strength of faith and not upon the weakness of sense. Consequently, it must not attempt to force fervor or the feelings of it, or take up any kind of particular devotion with a view of gaining satisfaction or assurance that something is thereby accomplished. Such a course would only beget a multiplicity contrary to that simplicity of spirit to which God is drawing it. And the more simple it is interiorly, the better prepared it is for divine union. So the soul has merely to yield to the attraction it feels for quiet repose, to be susceptible and docile, to the communications and inspirations of grace. The essence of this common form of mystic prayer is the desire for God. The soul feels only this one desire and need, and its time is generally spent in groping after God, though it may be unconsciously. This desire for God is, of course, a spiritual activity of the will, and is not manifested in feelings of affection or emotions of fervor. Hence, it is trying to mirror nature. But the soul will gradually learn that not what can be felt matters, but what is above feeling, that not what can be seen is of value, but what is beyond sight. Flesh and sense are insipid to the spirit, not having the victorious power of that faith, which is now the source of the soul's growing strength in contact with God, and which makes it persevere, as if seeing him who cannot be seen. This obscure way of faith which is the truly mystic and contemplative way, may, in its more arid and hidden manifestation, last for years. To whatever degree of strength it develops, even the most extraordinary, the element of obscurity remains, because it is a way of faith and not of sense. This is evident in the lives of the saints. When St. Jane de Chantal was questioned about her prayer, she replied that it was a time of helplessness, of almost stupidity, She hardly knew how to describe it. She remained in this state for many years. Yet it was this very mystic and arid prayer that wrought her sanctification, and to which she was ever inclined. She writes, His goodness bestowed upon me this method of devotion, consisting in a simple beholding and realizing of His divine presence, in which I felt at rest with Him. By my unfaithfulness, I have opposed it much, permitting entrance into my mind of fears of being useless in this condition, so that, desiring to do somewhat on my part, I spoiled all. And yet, oftentimes, am I attacked by this very fear, not in this devotion, but in my other exercises, where I would ever be active and multiplying acts, although well aware that I thus drew myself from my center. Above all, I see that this unique and simple looking toward God is my only remedy and sole consolation. And certainly did I follow my inclination. I should do naught but this without exception. For when I think to fortify my soul with thoughts and discourses, resignations and acts, I expose myself to new temptations and difficulties, and can only do it by a violent effort which leaves me dry. So it behooves me to return promptly to this simple abandonment. Here is an exceptionally clear expression of this state of spiritual prayer. The saint dwells on the tendency of mere nature to oppose the sweet attractions of divine grace and to be ever harping on its own activities, though without success. 
it is hard to kick against the goad. Yet her deepest inclination was to remain at her center in a peaceful, simple looking toward God. At times, the prayer may indeed become more vivid by a further development or impulse of grace. But the ordinary state is that which she has depicted and concerning which she writes in another place. There are certain souls among those whom God leads by this way of simplicity, whom he strips of all satisfaction, desire, and feeling, so that they can scarce endure or express themselves, because what is passing within them is so slight, delicate, and imperceptible, being wholly centered in the extreme point of the Spirit that they cannot speak of it. The soul finds in this condition, with the attendant difficulties, a fruitful source of worry and anxiety. And when it consults its confessor or director, it can at most only get assurance that it is going right, and a little encouragement to persevere. As to the director himself, he is confidently reassured by these and similar reactions. The frequent self-examinations of the penitent, together with the vague and confused nature of his questions, offer a clue to go by. Sometimes the sign may not be so clear, yet the essential characteristics are there. Sadreo lists a number of test points indicative of the contemplative way. He asks, for instance, 1. Is the soul repelled by considerations and by discursive prayer? 2. Does it perform duties more from duty than inclination, seeking consolation in prayer only? 3. Does it experience a vague, unreasoned, but profound distaste for everything that is not God or does not bear relation to Him? 4. Does it feel a quiet happiness in being alone with God, without having anything special to say to Him. In such a state, one need not fear delusion, attributing it to imagination or pretense. This prayer cannot be simulated, and it rather comes as a surprise to one to find he is in the mystic state. It is also different from what he might have expected, imagined or read about, and so uncongenial to nature. It may even seem to be nothing at all, a waste of time, for there is not anything there for the imagination or senses to lay hold of. It is truly the way of blind faith, yet from it the soul does get a certain satisfaction of peace, barely felt, because spiritual and in the depth of the soul. Another peculiarity of this state is the soul's choice of spiritual reading. Previous to the appearance of interior prayer, only such books as dwelt on the particular and the definite brought satisfaction and profit, such as ascetical works, treatises on the virtues or the lives of certain saints. But mystical prayer brings a taste and desire for mystical writings, for books dealing with contemplation. The soul finds in such reading something that corresponds in some manner to its present state, an echo of its own experience. A person not walking in this path will get less or perhaps nothing at all in the way of help or satisfaction from reading of this kind. His will is moved only by the distinct, the clear, the definite, and these are necessary to occupy his faculties. But those in the way of mystic prayer are moved only by the indistinct, the obscure, the general, in a word by that impression of faith, spiritual and intangible through which they enjoy a loving knowledge of God. The sum and substance of it is that the soul should, at all costs, persevere in prayer, resolve not to relax or be overcome by discouragement or give up for any reason whatsoever. Whether in dejection or elation, let it firmly and confidently pursue its daily practice. Let it have courage and trust, worthy of the loving God, who is leading it safely and happily on the path he intends. With this prayer comes all the soul's good, its holiness, its happiness. And even though, at times, the prayer is distressing or distracting, miserable or dull, invaded by worry and anxiety, let the soul remember the advice of the Abbot Chapman. Possibly the best kind of prayer is when we are unable to do anything. If, then, we throw ourselves on God and stay contentedly before Him, worried, anxious, tired, listless, but, 
above all and under it all, humbled and abandoned to his will, contented with our own discontent. If we can get ourselves accustomed to this attitude of the soul, which is always possible, we have learned how to pray, and we can pray for any length of time, the longer the better, and at any time. Thus it is evident that prayer is the more excellent, the less sensible it is, and the less perceptible to the soul. It would be a mistake, then, to think one is not praying, unless he uses discursive prayer. To think nothing is accomplished except by speaking, thinking, feeling. And great would be the mistake, too, in seeking to remain in these elementary forms when grace speaks by way of the mystic, spiritual, interior prayer of the heart. End of chapter 9